we go, dealing with the topic of churchless spirituality, recovering the essence of community. I think this is important now, not only uh, locally for Adventists, but for all the Christian, old Christians in general. Because this trend of church spirituality has been spreading all around, you know, in different denominations. This is the sentiment of our time that people are somehow skeptical towards structures and church, anti-institutional, you know, they just think that, okay, we can live without church. So this is a key question for us, and I, actually I'm curious to hear your answers. Can a person be a true Christian without being a part of the church? Hmm. It's a trick question. Watch out. <laughs> mm -hmm. if, let's say if you understood this in this kind of spiritual sense, body of Christ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh huh. Aha, uh -huh. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I would say you cannot be a true Christian because one thing about being a Christian is also bringing part of a fellowship. Mm -hmm. As in normally Christian is always used in the terms of being isolated, kind of some, somewhat similar to a monk. But mm -hmm. being a Christian means you have to be with other people. Mm -hmm. And the true definition of church is fellow people in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe you can't be a true Christian without being part. Okay, yeah. so here's I would differ from this mm. okay. uh, because uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking at <coughs> a different perspective. You know, uh, if I'm a Muslim, you know, mm -hmm. I can't go to church. My life is in danger. <coughs> so if I'm at home with my family, that's in church. You know, yeah. or but that's still church for you. That's then, still right? church. It's still church. Um, or oh, if church. I don't have, if like yeah. for example, my, my wife is not a, a Christian, uh, a, a Christian yet. It's only me, but I'm living in fear. I have to hide. Mm -hmm. So that's not fair for me. Mm -hmm. Like not being a true Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see, for me, it's not fair because then it depends on us to be part of it rather than God. Uh -huh. The way I look at it. Okay. Thank you, Samir. I'm just thinking, being a part of a church doesn't necessarily be, mean that you have to be there. Yeah. So in a yeah. case like yours, if, if a person can't actually attend church in that way, or be part of a community because it's dangerous, they can still be, like, they don't need to be present to be a part. So... Um, so geographical absence, let's say you live in Siberia and there is the closest church is like uh, 300 miles away and then you simply can't get there in the gathering of Christians, can you still be regarded as Christian? That's what you're, what you're saying. It's like a heart presence rather than a physical presence. But is that when you pick to not be there or when you just can't be there because of circumstances? Because what if you wake up tomorrow and you go, well, church is just not for me? Are you then still a true Christian or not? Like church, as in the building, going to the building every Saturday. I don't think church is a building, though. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean. But you know what I mean. If yeah. you like tomorrow choose, hey, this church thing is not for me. Are you still a true Christ Christian? Um, like if Divinia is living in Siberia, she just can't be there because of the thing. Because I think that's the difference, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. How uh, if we so saw the definition of church, like Methodist church, Seventh-day Adventist church, Pentecostal church, mm -hmm. so it's still churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I belong to Seventh-day Adventist church, mm -hmm. you know, rather than, you know, I'll go and change the carpet in a different church. That's a different meaning mm -hmm. of church. Mm -hmm. But, but the sentence says the church, not a church. <laughs> Just a question to maybe discuss a little bit. What's the minimum ecclesia, ecclesiological minimum? So this church can be like a very like spiritual thing that you feel spiritual connection to somebody who has the same spirit, by the virtue of having the same spirit, um, and Holy Spirit connects you. So you don't necessarily know those people that you are part of. Uh, you know, you don't have the experience of them. That can be one aspect of church, or it can be some kind of maybe a small demonstration, two, three people gathered in Christ's name, or it can be a whole denomination as church, or a building as church, a particular space that you go to. You can see how now the definition of church becomes very important. But yes, yes. The two people. 
you, uh, you need at least to uh, to be called church, yeah, yes. yeah. Jesus is, you know, I have other sheep in different pen, which I want to bring in this pen. So those sheep on the other pen still belong to Christ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they kind of part of this invisible body, yeah, uh, spiritual body, and then they'll be pulled into visibility, yeah. But can you be like a Christian without necessarily meeting with other fellow Christians who believe the same? I don't think you can keep it up for very long yeah. alone. Mm. Mm. I think that's the importance of it. And in the sense, is, it, is then the church essential for your Christian identity or is it peripheral? Like, is it good just because it helps you grow further and so on? Or is it really, you can't imagine Christian existence without community? The form of church is important for your mm -hmm. existence mm -hmm. as a Christian. Yes. 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 But yeah. whether it is the six of us, yes. or just you and me and Kay getting together and having church one day while cooking, I think it's mm -hmm. a form of church is, is mm -hmm. essential. Yeah. Interestingly, this, this group of people who are uh, church leavers, if you analyze who they are, usually those are the people who jump off the ship of the main church, you know, they... they they somehow feel that they, they don't have the place here, but then they end up picking and choosing uh, sometimes to go to spiritual concert or to go to a small study group or to go to their own people for picnic and spiritual group of people. So they're choosing other form of communities and uh, somehow they believe that church should have be, be that, more informal, more organic. So we could not necessarily say that there, there are people who are really Antichrist, you know, anti against God, rebellious people, people who actually leave the church because they believe that this kind of structure that we have today is not necessary for your Christian life. But you can see how it's hard to really define it. Already our attempt to answer it um, revealed few pos possible alternatives and solutions. Um, it's hard to ask. And this is actually one of the fundamental questions that we are facing in postmodern times. Uh, if you really follow the qualitative study of Alan Jaminson, and you want to see what's the problem there. Why are they leaving the church? He had a few uh, books, and it, 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 they have even later versions. Uh, Churches Faith, Faith Journeys Beyond the Churches. So he wants to track people who left the church. And by, by the word qualitative versus quantitative, what does it mean? Quantitative, you have a, lot, a big number of people answering yes or no, okay? Or circling the questions. But qualitative is when you sit with people, you have interviews, in-depth interviews, trying to understand the reasons why did they leave. This, this is, these are the factors that he actually discovered in his study. Alan Jamison being a sociologist. Um, people feel that they are not fitting in the church. They feel that uh, there are doctrinal differences and they can't just be bothered to be among the especially conservative people who have particular uh, way of grasping things or liberal and so on. So there are doctrinal divergences. Also, there's some kind of spiritual and emotional bullying. They feel that, you know, they constantly feel that they're not, not good enough, okay? And somebody, somebody else being on superior grounds telling them what to do. What is your right to say somebody what, what you should do and so on? So they feel this, they're, mis they're being abused, so to say. Then the church feels irrelevant, claustrophobic and controlling. There's a sense of powerlessness, okay? You can't do anything. And um, this is what... Um, often happens, let's say last year there was one church here in UK, they got a new pastor who technically came to them and say, saying to the most influential people in the church, saying, um, thank you, your services are no more needed. And he just put his own people in place and people who have similar opinion. And there's a large group, 40, 50 people, natives and uh, mostly white, leaving the church and uh, now they're trying to meet up. They, simply they were marginalized in, in, in group. So they tried to create documents to go and try to solve the issues and, and go to conference, go to unions. Somehow they were not heard. They left the church because they felt powerless. Like there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do, you know. Did they leave the church or did they leave that church? They're still spiritual. They're meeting up. They created their own gatherings, you know. But at the same time, they they felt that they were, their voice was not heard. Somebody else makes decision and you can't do anything about it. Okay, so this is the powerlessness that I'm talking about. That, you know, when you, no matter what you do, things will not be changed. Then you feel like, what's the point of me being here? Nobody will even notice because I'm not making any difference here. And then there is a lack of spiritual development. People going to church from 
Sabbath to Sabbath. But in the end, you see those people who were in church for 50 years struggling with some baby questions, you know, like spiritually immature questions. And then you ask yourself, nothing changed in their life. They wasted their Christian life in this church. So this might happen to me. I don't see much change in it. It's simply boring, all these routines, you know. And, um, and then maybe some, some people who sinned and who failed, instead of now being embraced by community and helped to go through the crisis, they were judged. So their, their case was mishandled. And uh, they were not treated compassionately, you know. So they did not really see Christ in the, in the behavior of church. So those are the reasons which were listed by people who were interviewed as different reasons for leaving the church. But now, um, the surprise in this analysis was that 94% involved of people who are leaving the church are actually in leadership positions. Middle-aged, usually we say young people leave the church. No, middle-aged were leaving. Now we have students age like being the dominant one in 20s and 30s. People facing the academia, feeling that faith is irrelevant, they're leaving the church. But this is not necessarily just young people because they feel that they don't know Christ, they don't want Christ. And they were more than 15 years in the church. People being pastors and leaders leave the church because they feel that this is not changing anything, we are not going anywhere. And I know people who are actually leaving for, because of those reasons. This is the category of le church leaders that few seem to expect. Okay, they, they did not expect this. This is a very surprising study. They were compared as travelers, and I just uh, give this quotation of his, travelers who abandon a luxury liner in a mid-cruise. They grow tired of endless buffets and entertainment, the carefully designed activities, or the captain who makes all decisions about the ship's speed and direction. Logging to experience what is not on the itinerary, they sell all they have to buy a small boat and leave well-traveled sea lines for uncharted waters. You know, when, when everything is scripted, when everything is decided by somebody else, endless buffets, everything, endless programs, you feel like th there is not, no larger contribution to your life or you can't contribute to this, then you want to experience the adventure. And small groups do have this adventurous aspect. They're more charismatic. You jump into the ship, into a small boat, and then you venture into the uncharted waters, exploring the, the, the touristic field uh, on your own, in your own pace, your own rhythm. That's how Christians would feel, those people leaving the church. Analysis, why uh, or what kind of people are leaving? People feeling the anti-institutional sentiment. They're protesting against formalism and uniformity. Why do we have to really embrace this sameness? Everybody has to be the same. Why can't we understand differences? And preference for a low level of commitment. People saying, you know what? If this church doesn't work for me, why would I stick to it the entire life? I just go into something which is meaningful and purposeful. So it's logical, logical answers why they, what, they, what they are giving. And I, I feel in largely we being part of this generation, we could feel this sentiment. And I bet each one of the persons here ask himself or herself a question, at least one in the life, what on earth am I doing here? Okay. <laughs> every day. So we have those, yeah? Do you think in that case it's important uh, in our churches if uh, we're in a lead lead leadership position then to create a space and opportunity for other people to become part of what is going on with the movement of that vision of the church? Yes, yes. To at least uh, like I'm going to say my Bill Havels <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> he said uh, people don't, don't necessarily uh, his equal, I'm giving his quotation is people don't necessarily uh, need to be uh, uh, you don't necessarily need to uh, follow what people will say mm -hmm. but people want to be heard okay. so I, I'm, I'm, so people need to be given the space and opportunity to contribute yes. on the vision yes. but then within your theme you will make obviously the, the decisions but you need to incorporate and, and yes. you need to obviously find ways how as much as possible to to build in the yes. people yes. so everybody needs to be heard yeah. so when you were saying that it just we'll actually come to that part towards the end yeah i'm following here the osmers method like first one is you see what's going on okay so, so this is a kind of uh, you see around and this is the phenomena which we need to face as a church this is what's going on and we answer the question why is it going on what are the reasons why people are leaving and so on and what's the sentiment behind? So, um, so now we are moving into 
okay, so how do we respond to it theologically? Okay, so what do we do about it? The normative task. And then we're going to come to the pragmatic tasks, you know, so how, give us steps to that, yeah. So um, I, I don't know whether you're familiar with the Osmer's method, yeah? Those four are quite useful when you, are, you have a situation, you, we now analyze it, now we go into theology and then practical aspect. So what do we do about it, okay? And these are the typical reactions. Some people uh, choose to ignore this phenomena, but this phenomenon is not going away by them putting their head into the, into the sand. Uh, it's still going to happen and affect our churches. It's like a, ma a, it's a bomb under the structures of our church, okay? Um, some people try to fight against it, labeling those people leaving, saying, okay, these are not faithful enough, they did not persevere in their faith, they're not part of remnant. No, these are very spiritual people who are leaving, okay? So them, some people try to escape from it, you know, um, and different methods are proposing for that, or co to consent to it, to say, okay, maybe that's the way to be church now. Maybe there is no place for institutional church anymore. Maybe we should, we should function in small organic communities, based communities, as in South America, that, that what was happening in 1970s. So maybe that's the way to be a church, okay, in small groups. And the large institutional aspect, we should just avoid that. Um, so that's one way of doing it. If you do that, technically, um, we are then lose, losing the supra-local structure, lo losing the organization of church and so on. It's almost like a, the stage of disintegration that we talked about. We all function on our own and group ourselves somehow organically in small units and so on. Can you do that and still be part of the church, like uh -huh. uh, still be governed by the GC or not? <laughs> but how would they uh, execute their power? They technically, they don't, even, they don't even know that you exist technically, yeah. Oh, but would you then still be saying that you're a Seventh-day Adventist? Aha, uh aha. -huh, uh -huh. Can you still call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist if you, if you create your own movements? Is that a, is that a question you're asking? Now, these are all legitimate questions, yeah? I think the, the, the last response, maybe, actually, this is a very good opportunity. I see in this movement opportunity to raise the question of what the church is, how it should look like. Maybe that's a warning to us that something fundamental of church is missing. These weeks I talked about this communio aspect, community, relationality. Maybe we are actually lacking this regard to that degree, the people feel that this is not fulfilling their needs, this is not being the basis of their identity, not reaching the fu fullness that we talked about, so I might as well go. It's a warning to us to re-examine our existence. So this is, a, this is the proposal I would like to further, uh, further examine, the constructive engagement. Let's try to engage with this phenomena, but constructively, to see what can we learn from them and what can we offer. So engage with this phenomenon constructively by looking at the, this new challenge as a potential opportunity to deepen, strengthen, and achieve a more complete manifestation of the church, multidimensional relational nature. Technically, maybe that's for the chance for us to go back and to see what was this apostolic community all about. Now we are, we are moving from the uh, descriptive task, analytical task of Osman, we are moving now to the normative task. So trying to find this vision, how things should be, what things ought to be, okay? And uh, here we will come to the term koinonia. Um, I prepared the handouts here where you can find the summary of all those points. I, I did it on purpose so you can see the model of how you can, you can analyze things in um, moving from experience to theology back to experience, okay? And I listed the resources that might be useful for you. Um, if you can maybe pass this back. Um, here you, you can find in selected bibliography different writings regarding the church's spirituality if you, not, you want to know more about the phenomenon itself because I think we'll be facing this more and more. This is ha happening in the next 5, 10, 15 years. So that's a challenge you need to address somehow. Okay? So this will affect your church. People will be leaving not because they are rebellious, you know, but because they want to know Christ more. It's like a contradiction almost, you know. So what do, I, what do you do? You can't critique them, you know. You need to engage with them. How, how do you engage with them? And then the, yeah, there are books talking about responding to these cultural trends in general, but more closely connected to this uh, koinonia study now are those resources under the rubric number three, the concept of koinonia in the field of biblical and systematic studies. I like the book of Lorelei Fuchs, 
I don't know, you know how to pronounce this without sounding very bad. Um, so she had a chapter there about the biblical basis of koinonia as a term. So if you want to see how the term was used in biblical times, in biblical texts, this nun, which did uh, this remarkable complex work, you know, and uh, made a great impact in theology, is quite useful to read, I think. Koinonia and the quest for ecumenical ecclesiology. Um, also, there are some more purely New Testament studies of Paniculum as well as Campbell and so on, dealing with the word itself, the term itself, which is also useful to read, I would say. Uh, but what I did here is, uh, I went through those books and I went to the New Testament, uh, tracking all the 30, I think 39 places where Koinonia is found, um, and trying to, to recover what are the dimensions involved, the dimensions of this Koinonia. Maybe we'll, we'll discover that some of those dimensions is missing from the current understanding of church. And we need to recover it. And once we recover it, we're going to prevent this church leavers to try to find what's missing somewhere out. We can actually have it already here. So uh, here are six conclusions of mine that koinonia, whenever it's mentioned in New Testament, it's uh, theocentric or pneumatocentric or Christ-centered. So uh, we have a Pentecost, Holy Spirit coming down upon the people and then people are gathered, and the first reaction of the work of the Holy Spirit is formation of koinonia. That's his work. He, he creates some kind of new entity, social entity. Why am I emphasizing this? The moment our church lose the sense of divine presence, that's when they stop to be attractive to people. Even us. If you just see human beings singing, preaching, it's just a project. I can find much better developed projects outside and you can find it too. Why we come to the church is because of the presence of God, because we believe there is a Shekinah, the revelation of God, which is somehow being mediated to all those people. When we listen to the words of other human beings, that somehow God can use that to feed us spiritually. The moment we lose this uh, vision of God's glory in our church, that's the, then our church becomes the, the place of manipulation, of politics, when people want to distance themselves from it because they only see the human element in it. So that's why koinonia is something which is distinguished from other koinonias or communities around because it's theocentric. It's started by God, it's maintained by God, and it's going to be completed and fulfilled, reach its full potential because of the intervention of God. If you lose perception of God in this community, we are technically losing the church. Church is not anymore the community of believers with God in Christ through the Holy Spirit. The moment you cut the second part, from the church, you just have pure bureaucratic structure and corporation as any other, entertainment program, okay? So what I believe is that if we retrieve this vision of God's presence and, uh, and constantly bring this back in front of the eyes of believers, this is going to be a magnet, which is going to be attract postmoderns. Even people who believe differently than us, once they know that God is being revealed here in this particular time and space and His presence can be sensed, wow! People are going to rush for that. They're going to come in to, 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 so they can be part of this revelation of God. Now, okay, um, so you have a question from Kwame. Yeah, because yeah, when, you, when you said that, in terms of it's, in, it's important for us to keep that divine vision. Yes. Right? So, would you say, I'm kind of going to ask a question in terms of to point fingers uh -huh. a little bit. So, if that's the case, in spite of everything that goes in on in the church, in terms of the problems we listed, in terms of, um, what is it, not fitting in, doctrinal divergences, um, emotional bullying, a sense of powerlessness, mm -hmm. would you say that it is, and it, it is the people's fault for leaving, or would it be your own fault for leaving? Mm -hmm. Because with regards to what I'm thinking in terms of, that divine vision, that's something that you yourself have to keep. It's something that can't be influenced so much by external, that yeah. Yeah. It influences you so much to leave. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, so whose responsibility, people who are leaving or the people who are kind of doing the church, yeah? Is that, is that what your question that's kinda, is? That's the question I'm kind of getting at. Because mm -hmm. right now, because basically these reasons that I've shown is more external. Yeah. You know, it's a bit of a battle between external and the internal. You know what, I, I, my first in instinctual reaction is I would blame those who are in a position of more sp spiritually mature people who are not doing their job. 
like Apostle Paul, he says, instead of now uh, eating hard food, you require baby's milk. You who should be didaskaloi, those people who, uh, who are teaching, who are teachers, who are, you know, you are not doing your job also. You know, so I would say that, okay, primary I would start there saying, okay, if you're in leadership position, and let's assume that you're in a higher spiritual position, like a more mature, you have people who are babies in the church, who don't see necessarily what God is doing. You have a responsibility for them to really be there and to mentor them into this worldview, that they can notice God, even though if um, sometimes they can experience a human element, they can be hurt, they can be, you know, really experience, have bitter experience, that you help them to see God behind that also, behind that human perversion of, you know, to understand, for they can understand that this is human element, but it is also divine. But I would also say that each Christian has a responsibility to, to nourish this vision of God's presence. Yeah. Because that's something that's going on. I mean, especially in this conference. Yes. Right? Yes. There are a lot of people leaving the church, and so now the leaders are trying to put or do things to yes. try and prevent that. Yes. But from what you just said, there's so much they can do, especially because. For example, those leaders yes. were only able to see them once a week. Yes. The rest of the time, they're all in the world. Yeah. And especially, I, I guess, I don't know when, um, what's his name, Jameson did the study, but um, in terms of the age, the age range, but I find that the age range is getting... Lower now, yeah? Yeah, so technically this was like 12 years ago. The reason why I did not use anything recent, because I did not have the access to it, especially in Europe. Um, and there are no more thorough studies within Adventism. This would be useful now. If I had those, I would present them. I think that's the place where you can, if you write master dissertation on that, uh, who that would be very useful for your church, to know exactly why people are leaving the church. And this changes, and it was in Northern American context. So there are different ways how this does not apply to our condition. But I think there are also, there are also similarities. At least we can start our reflection about it through that. So yes, uh, if, if you find some more uh, up-to-date sources, please let me know. This will be useful for me too. Uh, be because we need to base our response on the evidence, you know, to see what's actually going on and why. Uh, but I, here there is also a danger of, you know, when the church board meets and they make all sorts of decisions, they're arguing and they're coming to a decision, and often it's very human in the end, the whole procedure. And, and then forgetting God in the process, creating this as a business, you know, we should all be aware this, this is our common responsibility. Why not provide space where experiences are shared and testimonies, what God is doing in this church? What did he do this week in your life? And to have the culture which allows people to say things without being ridiculed, without being laughed at, okay? So this is how you open up more space for people to notice God create the witness, uh, provide space for it and talk about it, you know. Be open for failures and for uh, ups and downs, you know. Let them be open to, to share their experiences. And that's how God is going to be, uh, uh, let's say, manifested through their gifts, through what they can offer. Um, then, I noticed that Koinonia always had these two directions. Remember when we talked about um, vertical, vertical and horizontal community? This is why it's important. Um, the text says in 1 John 1, from 1 to 4, um, we preach to you so that you can have koinonia with God and with us. So these two dimensions then are later elaborated further in the whole epistle. And technically what he's claiming, you can't say that you love God if you don't love each other. And usually when you love each other, that's the proof that you love God. So the closer you get to each other and the, the better you treat each other, that means that you know God better the closer you're going to be to the top. And just geometrically, if you present it this way, the closer you go to the top of this triangle, the closer you are also to each other, the less space is between you, okay? So this community, if it doesn't have this lower, lower part of triangle, this, this part here, if it doesn't have that, then this is individualistic Christianity, church and spirituality. If it does not have those aspects, then we are talking about communism. Okay, people forming the perfect heavenly order without necessarily referring to God. But if we don't have one of the aspects, maybe this side of the triangle, then we have mission. One person which is connected to God, which is then trying to convert others and encourage them to, to relate to God and to themselves. So you don't have koinonia, full koinonia. 
in order for full community to be established, each person has to be, have the individual relationship to Christ and then by the virtue of their relationship with Christ be united with other believers and with God. So this is the process, it takes time and there is a whole possible series here how you can help members, you know, you can have series about it and sermons, helping them to really approach God closer and each other. Uh, and then koinonia is going to find fuller manifestation. So this is how this koinonia differs from other community, precisely because it's connection to God. Then we come to this holistic aspect, very important. Koinonia was often used as a verb to simply refer to the donation. We'll send you koinonia to Jerusalem because you're poor. Money, resources. So it, it does involve what you do, what you give, your possessions. But also, there is koinonia in pieces, in, in faith. So we, we share the way we, build, we perceive God, okay? But there is also koinonia, um, you know, it's, it involves the entire life. United emotions, united, you know, uh, way of thinking, even practice, common action and mission. Um, there is in Galatians, I think 2.10, uh, there is a text saying that a person gives the hand of koinonia to another fellow workers so they can do the mission together. So doing mission together is also an aspect of koinonia. So what we learn here is that koinonia is not the matter only of what happened in your head. It's a very practical, it's a very life-related thing. I told you the whole story about uh, Robert's house burning down and then people helping and bringing whatever they had. So this kind of story is, you know, when people are actually putting themselves out there for you, sharing their life, their resources, that's something which is much more powerful witness than the witness which is just containing your doctrines. Okay? Does it make sense? So that's why I think it's involved the total life. And this is where we come to, once we say that it involves the total life, we come to the aspect of interdependence. And we discussed it already, so we're not going to spend much time. Interdependence meaning that we provide the space, as, as Pastor said, um, space for each person to manifest its potentials and to f have space to experience God and contribute to community. I think this could be our lifelong project to provide this space in a church. Otherwise, people are leaving the church because they feel powerless. Somebody else is deciding about the worship style constantly, you know, uh, or which carpet the church is going to buy. Usually people who are more influential, have more money, are part of influential family. They are this aristocracy of spirit, elite of the spirit, which are making decisions. You feel powerless. So this is this model of dependency that we talked about yesterday. And then independence is technically everybody just doing their own business. There is no cohesion. There is no common sentiment and goals. Yeah. In both cases, when the church went, it goes into left and right, towards dependency and authority and coercion, people leave the church because this kind of relationship is really forcing their, um, forcing them in a certain direction that the Holy Spirit is not, not leading them in, you know. So they feel the Holy Spirit is somehow being hindered by our structures, which are dependent structures, coercive structures. On the other side, there is this independent model is so chaotic, nobody knows who, what other person is doing. And you can see that there is no genuine interest in your own life, you know. People just chasing their own careers, their own reputation, and so on. There's one verse which is a beautiful verse. In, uh, in Philippians 2.4, the text says, study the happiness of others. And the word scopos, scopos versus blepo. You know, blepo is when you, when you see, when you observe, when you notice things. But scopos means intentionally observe, intentionally observe with focus, like microscope and telescope. When you intentionally observe certain, you have tools, you have your directed attention you're directing your attention to a particular aspect and spending time and analyzing and studying, that word is being used to say study the happiness of each other, you know, or, or what belongs to others. You be interested in what's going on uh, with, with the person here. Allow space for them. Have your own space, but also allow space for them to manifest their gifts and for their happiness and their fulfillment to be expressed. Um, Ellen G. White also applies this verse when talking about marriage, saying that the highest duty of each marriage partner is to study the happiness of others, to see what makes them happy. There should be a separate class in our school. How do we recognize that? How do we discover what's the passion of the person next to you? And then you find your ultimate fulfillment by, by helping that person reach the passion. 
you know, this is how you serve the community. So this interdependent relationship actually means that you are, you love yourself because you want to find a place for yourself in this church, but also you love other people. You want to help them reach their own potentials and goals. Sometimes this will mean that you need to step down. Sometimes that means you need to go in the background, but sometimes that means you need to step up and lead. Okay, so this has different implications. Here I'll just tell you a short story. Um, I want to address a particular group of people in church who feel that their uh, contribution is insignificant. Like one of those talents which nobody notices. Um, because my uh, grandma had one of those talents which is, like, she never wanted to pray publicly and to have speech or something like that. Like she hated it. Even thought about her being invited to pray in the church it was terrible. You know, she could not sleep for that. Because she doesn't like this public attention. But she's always in a, she was sitting in a, uh, she passed away last year, but she was sitting in the last row and uh, noticing the needs of people who are rejected and people who do not have lunch and who are, you know, usually marginalized and always invited them for lunch. So what she could do, she could cook well, she could listen to people and really empathize with them. So people are coming to her place often to feel refreshed, you know and spiritually kind of guided and, and nurtured. And uh, you can understand, her, he, she, her gift is not necessarily recognized publicly, but there's a lot of people who are affected by it. And she always said to, says, you know, I don't have any talents, any gifts, you know, God didn't give me that. Not noticing what, how her life is changing other people. Um, and how this sensitivity developed. Technically, she was homeless. Uh, because of her, fa her family was rejected, uh, moving from Catholicism to when her mom, mom became Adventist, they were rejected. They had a, a rich family. This is a, like a noble family in Italy. They owned the whole chain of uh, bakeries and restaurants, like, uh, like a hotel. So they were really, really well-off well family. And then mom, mom becomes um, Adventist and she's rejected. Um, father dies after, three days after because he, he was beaten by the spider. So there is mother and daughters left. Um, and the mother remarries a guy to try to help them also to survive because this was a time of war, Second World War, where they could not even find food. But this, uh, and then mother dies with a baby in the stomach also. And there's a whole story there that uh, nuns in the hospital did not want to take care of her because she was sectarian. So she, they put her there when it was leaking and there was rain and they let her give birth to a baby alone. Nobody wanted to help her. The whole night she was begging for water, begging for help, and nobody wanted to, nobody was allowed to help her because that's how Christ is punishing the heretic, okay? In the morning, my grandma comes to her mom and she was covered. When she uncovered the body, there was also a baby there, also dead. So then, then, then they had to bury them somewhere, but the, this stepfather was not really interested in providing the proper, you know, graveyard, uh, graveyard. so they put it together with other parties, other uh, soldiers in a common grave. So my grandma was singing instead of choir, singing in front of the grave of her mother. And the younger sister then was taken by some family and they didn't see for each other for a long time. So here she go. Here she goes, see, she's a homeless person. The only thing that she can do is actually she can sing very nice. You know, she has very high colored soprano, you know, Dalmatian type, you know. Um, she sa sang about Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, on the grave of her mother. But then she, her lifestyle led her in different different direction. Um, people are trying to accept her in their homes, but she was constantly going from home to home, not having her own place. So she knew what it means to be rejected on your own, then you're hungry. And she says, Tiki, you don't know how it is to be hungry, extremely hungry. You, are, you can eat anything, you know. She was searching on the street to find the bread, but it was too um, hard. So she, then she puts it into water, but then there's also those worms inside already. So she takes them out and then she eats. And then having all kinds of skin diseases and stuff, you know, life on the street, very rough. And, um, but there are some good members, one grandma especially, which ac accepted her in her home and they had only one couch, so they slept together. And this grandma was constantly repeating to her, Angelka, I know that your son of your happiness is going to warm up my old bones, you know. But my grandma grave up on any prospect of a good life, um, especially marrying somebody, you know, 
uh, because who would want her? She's kind of naked on a street, you know, doesn't have anything, doesn't have the mir miras, which is technically the wedding gift that you had to have in order to be married in that particular time. So who would want her? And then people in the church, uh, they, they noticed that um, she doesn't have anything else to wear. And I think they, they, she did had, okay, sorry, this is a different story. Uh, she did have this uh, black, uh, no, the, 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 the blue, how do you say, bread bedding, blanket. She made herself the, uh, the clothes out of that, you know. And then started to notice, oh, who is that lady dressed in, in, in blue? You know, so the guys were inquiring. So she, she was very tall and nice looking. But, um, and they started to, to hang out with her. And they, they went to Vojvodina, which is part of Serbia now, which is around 500 kilometers away. And there was a tall guy, like very tall, like more than two meters tall, my grandpa <laughs> with mustaches and sitting in the back row. And she was asked to sing the same song, Jerusalem that she sang on the graveyard and she sang it. And this guy was completely into her. She noticed him too, but she didn't dare think that something is possible for her. And, um, uh, and then she went back to Croatia and all the time she had this idea, you know, her mind, oh, grandpa, you know, and the gram uh, grandpa, that's not for her. Um, this handsome young guy, but she didn't dare to dream that this is possible, this kind of relationship until she got the letter. But she could not re read uh, Serbian language, Cyrillic. So she went to the pastoral office and then she asked them, um, so um, could you translate this for me? I got the letter. And then the pastors are reading and thinking, okay, Angelka, I think this man is for you. You should marry this guy. He's actually writing the letter. Dear Angelka, will you marry me? They don't even, they don't even know each other. <laughs> like at that time it was less complications, it seems. <laughs> you like the girl, you go for, for her. You know, so he offers the marriage. And she was in the moment so excited, like her life dreams are being fulfilled. But at the same time, she was a bit skeptical. Once she know that I'm just not the stage person, and once she knows who I am and that I don't have anybody, you know, he will leave me. So she decided to be honest and to be transparent. So she sent him the letter. Dear Isa, thank you for your proposal, but I'm sorry. I'm naked on the street. I don't have anybody, anything. So sorry, I have to decline your offer. So she sent the letter back. And there was, it took some time, a few weeks, and so she thought, this is it. But then the letter came back. Again, the pastoral office reading the letter, a love letter, um, and then translating to her. And then the letter, there were words. Each time that she says those words, she was crying. It went apparently very, very deep into her heart. I can't even understand always what, what was so meaningful to her. But she sa the letter said, um, Dear Angelka, I did not ask you whether you are rich or poor, whether you have something to dress or not, whether you have somebody or not. I asked you, will you marry me? And for the first time, she experienced that she is accepted right as she is, without pretending, without masks. She is accepted by him. And of course, she said yes. Now, she tells me now, just before she died, she was telling me the story also of her during her wedding, which happened in Novi Sad, the place where I grew up, where she met my grandpa, first time singing that song, yeah, she turned around and her family was not there, you know. And this might be hard for, for ladies, you know. Father is not here to take you through the aisle and so on. So she's alone. But then the entire church stood up for her as a family. And then she said, then she made a covenant, not only to this guy, my grandpa, that she will be his wife, but that she, is, she will open the house to everybody who also went through this kind of trial, trials and rejection. So this, is, this was her life mission. Because she was hurt, because she was rejected, she was able to really read people. How can she, I was sometimes really wondering, how does she know what's in that person's mind and heart? You know, When she talks to them, they're crying, they're all like approaching to her, and they're coming. My friends, even from high school and from people who don't have any connection to this old lady, they're they come and before they come to me, they go to her. And sometimes they spend two or three hours with her. I'm thinking, what on earth are you doing with my grandma? And here, like, what, what are you, uh, you know? So she is the witness of that. She, she, she's always like a very like, optimistic lady, you know? And uh, even when grandpa died, she said, you know, I, I will not feel sorry for myself 
this self-pity is just self self-consuming thing you know it just deepens and deepens until you fall into depression I'll decide to spend my life for other people. So she was writing the letters, encouraging people. And sometimes it's funny to see her walking next to the Danube River because that's where we live, literally 15, 15 meters from Danube. And uh, I can see like, she's a, a tall grandma. There's a big grandma walking and the small grandma's around her and she's like <laughs> talking and leading them and you know, giving, giving them advice and so on. So there's a lady who realized that she has brokenness in her life. But then she says, you know what, God, I don't have other talents, but I have this brokenness. I bring this to you. That's my gift. I know how it is to be rejected, and I know what helped me, so I'm going to do that for other people. Now, the effects of that, this is a woman through whose house more than 70 people lived there. Not at the same time, of course. Over time, you know, people from the street, grandpa brings them or she brings them and so on. So they give them a job. Grandpa was a carpenter, so they do this. And she cooks for them. She was always cooking for a lot of, lot of people, you know. Our house is always open to that degree that sometimes the entire year, every sub Sabbath or constantly there is somebody around. We were never alone almost, you know. Um, and uh, this sometimes can be very annoying because you sometimes lack your private space. But this is a woman who said, you know what? I'm not here for, so, uh, on this earth so I can feel present, okay? I want to give myself for others. So here's how God, God's power can be revealed through our brokenness. And if you think you don't have any gift, offer God what you have. Often, when you are damaged somewhere, that's the place, exact place where God can use you to bless others who are going through the same. If you manage to go out and to have your own experience, how God delivered you, how He gave you a better life, when you experience what it means to belong to this community, then you are able to help others achieve the same. So this is a lifestyle which is, is for me a witness that no matter how small your gift is, even if you don't have a particular gift but brokenness and weakness, if you give it to God, He will make it worth it. More than 70 people, I did not mention that some of them are actually teaching at Andrews University, now having family and being very successful families, thanks to this old lady who said, Oh, I don't have any talent. So the encouragement is for those who feel that way, um, that your life can make a difference. And now let's come to the, to the end of this. Um, interestingly, the koinonia is often used. Koinonia always progresses, always expands internally and externally. Internally, the love of the people is growing deeper and deeper. But if community is only turned internally towards ourselves, when it becomes, as Crystal would say, end in itself, but in this negative sense, you know, that we are not interested in the world around us, we stop to grow, we stop to mature. Koinonia stops to be koinonia. Koinonia will uh, thrive and flourish if, if it maintains those dual, dual directions. It grows inside in love of other people, and we are loving each other, we enjoy each other's pre presence, but also we are sensitive to the people outside. That's why the early koinonia was mul multiplied so quickly. Thousands of people were joining the queues of the church. You can see that there is external growth and there is the internal growth. In the articles that are attached to your Moodle, I wrote a kind of text a few years ago, text dealing with those different dimensions, explaining them. In, in case you didn't catch everything, there you can read about it more. Okay? And then, uh, this is the final perspective. Now we are zooming out. This is a human reality. Okay, church which functions like that, which is generally open to people around it, to the needs of the world, but also offering love, offering you know, space for people to really fulfill their, their calling and the holistic community. This kind of community is really attractive to postmoderns. Modeling this, uh, it's, it's the best thing you can actually do in your church. You were mentioning that one of your passion is in the, when you go to Estonia to, Estonia to model this kind of fellowship. This will work better. This will work better than many, many words. Doctrines you need because it provides some kind of understanding of what's happening here. Uh, but they are not the only thing we need, to, we need to do. Cosmic perspective means that church does not exist only for this planet. We need to be aware that we have responsibility towards the entire universe. Um, and this vision was hidden from the beginning from the creation and was revealed to Apostle Paul. He says, this is, this is a mystery hidden from the beginning and now it's revealed to me. What's the mystery? And the, my favorite verse here in, in terms of ecclesiology, Ephesians 3.10, God's purpose in all this was to use the church, 
koinonia, to use koinonia to display his wisdom in its rich variety. You can imagine how that looked like when God's wisdom is displayed in rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Don't forget that our lives have internal consequences and cosmic consequences. This is the platform where God is able to show his power and wisdom in the way he puts together different broken elements, broken, finite, imperfect people. So other people, when they watch it, the whole universe, they can stand in a sense of awe, phobos, and they can say, behold how they love each other. Let them see the face of God in this community. So these are these different aspects of community. And I think if we start to live these aspects, this is how we are addressing the, the, the needs of the people who are leaving the church, church precisely because they feel something is missing. Um, so my, my recommendations, practical recommendations to, for the end is, if you really want to build our way towards deeper communi community, if you want to really deepen our church, we need to always be aware of three aspects. First, you achieve this by approaching closer to God, to maintain these dynamics of openness towards God, that you are constantly sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is doing within you, around you, through you. This is how you are maintaining this openness to God. And that's the, the beauty of this paradigm is you don't need to wait some kind of date in the future to do that and then announce in the church and prepare the sermon for it and lectures. No, you start today, immediately, now, during the class or after you ask God, where are you around me? That's, where you, that's, where, that's how you learn this art of uh, being openness for the astonishing aliveness of Christ and the Holy Spirit around you. And you'll see the closer you become, come to that spirit, you, you have this urge inside to connect to another human being. Like urge and necessity, it's like existential necessity. You recognize that you need them also to be, so to say, complete. You know, to, to, to have the, the complete experience of Jesus Christ. And here, that's why Ellen White was five times um, mentioning the prophecy, before Christ comes, his prayer in John 17 will be fulfilled, let them be one. So our primary task for waiting is not to guess the dates, not to try to punish others and to crit critique others if they don't attain the perfection of Christ. No, press together, press together, press together. Learn how to live together in community. And this is where actually you discover in the center of this God-human community, in the center you find your own identity and your own purpose. Now this becomes the grounds of your identity like those trees which are holding together with an interlocked system of roots, you know, keeping each other through the storms and through the crisis, this is where we become to each other. Solid in identity, balanced, solid, stable. And we can, we can survive and grow in our faith. And this is our next aspect. Growth will happen. True growth, organic growth happens in communities, not on your own, but in communities. Sometimes you have those Pauls in community who are helping others to mature, but you also have Timothys. Somebody who is maybe same level or a bit lower, but you also have somebody who is younger in faith. We have different levels of maturity, but together we learn in this process to grow. And then we experience pleroma of Christ. Everything what's needed for the journey, we experience to that. And then what will happen towards the world? We are not only preaching the gospel, not only serving them, but we embodying our message. The messenger in some miraculous act of God is being transformed in the process, not only to preach the message, but the message itself becomes the message. This radically different vision of truth, you are the truth, you become the truth, you embody the truth. In postmodern times, this is what's going to work. In modernist times, something else worked. Public debates showing that you're right, you know, critiquing others, showing superiority of your doctrinal position. In postmodern times, they will not care about it. They just want to see, is it authentic? Is it real? Does it work? So this is occasion for us to really embody the message, the messenger who becomes the message. And this, is, this transformative act is something which is, which is happening only as a result of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural work of God. An appeal. There is a word. This is the whole talk about koinonia, supplementing the vision of remnant through koinonia is not only human promise. Here is a promise in 1 Corinthians 1, 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the koinonia of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
So God is faithful. God is going to fulfill his promise, he said. And I think we should also, together with John, the experienced apostle, say, we preach to you so that you can have koinonia with us and with God. So we have to be the church, not necessarily defend the church. You know, and remember what I told you about Martin Luther and his saying, church is, uh, the gospel is like a caged lion. You don't need to defend the lion, just release it. That's the same with church. You don't need to defend the church to people who are leaving the church to say, no, you need it, you need it because of this, this is, you don't need to defend that. Church is powerful enough to defend itself. Just be the church, release the church and church will defend itself. So that's my appeal. Be the church in the change that you want to see. And you can start already where you are. And this is going to be the biggest proof, the biggest display of God's manifold wisdom. Amen. So I went from teaching to preaching. <laughs> but I think this is the way to address church spirituality, um, to demonstrate the community. Now, next class, our last class, we, will have, we can start in five minutes break. You know, so we can start in five minutes. And this is summer.